Coming up next on Texas Parks and Wildlife, for a few days in April, a variety of migrating songbirds pause along the Texas coast before continuing north. We'll visit the community of High Island to witness this springtime spectacle. On the Naturalist Journal, we'll introduce you to the growing sport of orienteering, where competitors use a map and compass to find their way along an unfamiliar course. There's a new way to experience our natural state. It's called the Texas Conservation Passport. We'll tell you all about this ticket to the great outdoors. And finally, we'll experience Texas with a visit to Hill Country State Natural Area, where traveling by horseback is still the most popular way to go. These stories are coming up next on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. It's hard to explain because it's a real emotional thing. I find birds absolutely magnificent. I think the colors are incredible and uh, it just leaves me full of wonderment. When I first saw these warblers down here, I was just entranced. I couldn't imagine anything so beautiful. And uh, especially there was the uh, black burning warbler. I think that sold me on this place. That was uh, 19, uh, let's see, that was 1958 or 59. Uh -huh. Today, the birds and the birders still come to High Island, just north of Galveston. Here, under a dense canopy of trees, this thick coastal woodlot provides a haven each spring for a variety of songbirds. Birders hope for a glimpse of just some of the species that pass through on their trip north. Known as neotropical migrants, these warblers, orioles, vireos, and others use these coastal woodlots on their annual migration to breeding grounds throughout the North American continent. In late April of each year, the possibility exists for a phenomenon known as a fallout. Weather patterns can force vast numbers of these neotropical migrants from the sky, resulting in large concentrations of birds in very small patches of woods. During a fallout, during a migrant grounding, I've seen the most jaded and experienced birders brought to their knees. <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's, a, it, it's an amazing event. When you've seen it, then it's, it, you, you know, you can only then can you fully appreciate it. It's hard to get across to people how special it is. And these birds arrive and they're tired, they're hungry, they're thirsty. Consequently, they don't pay a great deal of attention to people. So places like High Island, Candy Apture Wildlife Management Area are excellent places for people to come and watch these birds as they're preparing for their flights north. The numbers of birds using these woodlots can vary greatly depending on the weather. There's a lot of warblers in here today, and yesterday there was not. You see they had rain in the Gulf last night, and we have a cool norther. Uh -huh. And so uh, this is a good day. To understand why these coastal woodlots are so heavily used, it's helpful to look at the migration routes of neotropical birds. Many of these species winter in South and Central America. In the spring, they begin their migration north, pausing briefly on Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. From here, the birds either cross the Gulf of Mexico or travel along the coast to arrive at these woodlots. Here they pause again, before continuing to their breeding grounds further north. As the exhausted birds approach the Texas coast, these scattered woods are an attractive sight. Often, the first thing the birds will do upon arrival is seek out fresh water to rehydrate from their long trip over the Gulf. The birds also use these freshwater pools 
to remove any salts that may be clinging to their feathers after the ocean crossing. The dense vegetation found in these woodlots provides welcome food and shelter for the migrants. The variety of plant life, as well as the many layers of vegetation, support the different species that pass through here. Some of these hungry travelers are attracted to fruiting plants, such as this mulberry tree, while others will search the vegetation, hunting for small insects and worms plentiful in these dense woods. And still others just need to rest to recover from the difficult journey. Well, they land there because they're tired, they're exhausted, they've been battling a north wind, their fat reserves have been used up. And they need those woodlots because if they had to go another 50 miles to get to the forest of East Texas, more of them would die. These areas, in that sense, are a critical link between these broad wintering grounds and broad breeding grounds. To further understand the significance of these areas, one need only look at the surrounding countryside. Woodlots are small islands of habitat scattered within a sea of coastal prairies and marshes. Up and down the coast, development has destroyed many of the woodlots. Additional threats to the birds come from the destruction of forests further inland. Many of our hardwood forests have been cleared and fragmented, opening them up to competing bird species and predators that live along the forest edges. Many of the rich bottomlands where forest once stood have been converted for other uses. To reverse these trends, a variety of governmental agencies, including the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, have joined together with conservation groups, landowners, and industry to work together in a program called Partners in Flight. Well, the end goal is to, is to stop the uh, steep decline in native songbird populations. Whatever steps we can take to mitigate this loss, to halt this decline, and to bring back these uh, native populations is, uh, is the purpose of the project. The difference between partners in flight and, and managing for an endangered species is that we're doing something before those species become endangered. And in that case, I think that this program will be very successful. Instead of focusing on single species and single habitats, we're looking at protecting ecosystems, providing the whole array of habitat requirements from these species, from their wintering grounds in South America to the breeding grounds up in the northern parts of the United States and Canada. Partners in Flight is capitalizing on a growing public interest in birds. In recent years, commercial ventures such as this tour, conducted by Victor Emanuel Nature Tours, have been increasingly successful helping to raise public awareness and contributing to local economies. I think people uh, are hungry to get in contact with nature. I think after living in cities with the increased urbanization and, and uh, being divorced from nature, uh, they were hungry for that. And fishing and hunting provide important outlets for some people, but there were other people that wanted a different way of getting in touch with nature. The economic impacts of bird watching is phenomenal. This includes everything from the sale of bird seed to the purchasing of binoculars and bird books. 1989, 61 million bird watchers spent over $1 billion uh, pursuing their hobby. The local economy of Rockport, Texas realized about $6 million from the bird watching community. So the economic benefits are there. And it will just increase because the number one outdoor recreational sport in America right now is wildlife watching. These birders, and others like them, have helped focus national attention on the plight of migratory songbirds. While these coastal woodlots have long been a springtime destination for birders, it wasn't easy convincing governmental agencies of the importance of these areas. They were small, and at that point in time, people really questioned the value of them for neotropical migrants. Birds didn't breed here, birds didn't winter here. How in the world could they be of value? Uh, we certainly had empirical experience that said they were extremely valuable. It just took us a while to sell it. Today, the Partners in Flight program right. hopes to reverse the declines of recent years by increasing public awareness of the need to preserve and expand existing coastal woodlots. The more that people understand about these birds and have a gut feeling for them, the more likely they are to become active in their conservation. 
So I think that these coastal woodlots are, are very important for that reason. These birds are at a crossroads, at a geographic crossroads here and at a crossroads in their conservation. Many of the populations are declining, but they haven't declined to the point that they're on endangered species lists. This means that we still have a lot of flexibility and a lot of opportunity for conserving those populations. Well, I would say to everyone that if they can, can do something to save the habitat, to save this area and anything like it on the Gulf Coast and all, all the way up in the migration path, uh, they should do it. If they can donate some money or if they can take part and volunteer to work, well, that's the best thing that we can do, I think, for the birds, yeah. Coming up next on The Naturalist Journal, we'll look at a sport that combines the skill to navigate unfamiliar terrain with the competitiveness of a race. A map and compass, familiar to many, but mastered by only a few. Once the basics of these instruments are learned, anyone, young or old, male or female, can join the fun. Uh, I came because I enjoy orienteering. It's a lot of fun. I like being with this guy here. And um, I like being out in nature. The sport of orienteering, or using a map and compass to navigate unfamiliar territory, has attracted avid followers in Europe since the late 1800s. Slower to catch on here in the U.S., there is now a large following in the Northeast. We, we've come out from Hollis, New Hampshire, which is a little town outside of Nashua, New Hampshire, which is north of Boston, Massachusetts. This is an opportunity to do some orienteering starting early in the season. In New England, this time of year, there's still snow and it's pretty chilly, so uh, the orienteering season in New England starts a little later. Best of all, the sport doesn't require costly equipment. As little as $20 can buy a workable compass, add a topographic map, and away you go. The sport is quickly gaining popularity in Texas. Orienteering enthusiasts have formed clubs and set up organized meets, such as this one at Bastrop State Park, arranged by the Houston Orienteering Club. Complicated courses are laid out in advance to challenge the skill of these modern explorers. The courses also allow for different skill levels, Beginners to experts can all find a trail to follow. We also usually bring our children with us, and that's a lot of fun too, because you can start orienteering with very young children um, on very easy courses where they just follow a string in the woods, and our four-year-old son does that a lot now, and he really enjoys going. At trail's end, success is determined by having found all of the preset checkpoints along the way. Orienteering can also appeal to those with more competitive instincts, but unlike a standard race, Victory does not always go to the swift. The sport has been described as jogging for thinkers. Orienteering can provide new challenges and bring a knowledge of practical skills invaluable to all who venture off the beaten path. Even in unfamiliar territory, the experienced orienteer with a map and compass can confidently explore what Texas has to offer. Texas, a land of countless treasures. Its beauty abounds in every region of the state. The Texas Parks and Wildlife Department is the agency charged with protecting these natural resources. As our population becomes more urbanized, sales of hunting and fishing licenses have declined. To help offset this loss of revenue, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department is reaching out to new constituencies, those groups who now have the opportunity to do their part in preserving our natural resources. I'm all for it. My husband's a hunter, and of course he has his licenses, and he, you know, and I just, I feel like I ought to do my part too, to help. I believe that uh, many Texans need to be more aware of not only the beautiful areas we have in this state, but how fragile some of those areas are and the need to conserve them. And uh, by 
having one of these passes and visiting the state parks, you cannot help but become more aware of these things. I just think it's a tremendous opportunity to get to visit some of these natural places that uh, otherwise we, we wouldn't be able to. And at the same time, we're contributing to uh, the parks and wildlife folks to help upkeep these places. Getting into state parks whenever you want, not having to pay the entrance fee, that's the initial thing. But also being able to go on these trips, these tours that are given by qualified, um, experienced guides is wonderful. You probably can't tell it because you're so close to it, but there's an arc in the island, a kind of a bend. And where that bends, that changes the direction of the wind. And you see where all the shells are, way back up there. They're not down here on the edge where it, they just blow in fresh, but they're back here where the storm tides put them. So when we get out to shell again, we'll want to go back up there on that ridge and look amongst the, uh, the shells up there. Having studied the island for many years, Dr. Wayne McAllister of nearby Victoria College helps passport holders interpret their discoveries. All right, that's a Venus shell. These are arc shells. Of course, you know the oyster. These are the scallops. That's the tulip mussel. That's the razor clam. This is called a duck clam because this is what the diving ducks dive for to pick up. And you can see it's already broken out. It's a very, very fragile shell, and the duck's beak can easily crush that thing, and there's a good dollop of meat in there about the size of the end of your thumb and the diving ducks dive for that and just gobble it up. Just get out here and can enjoy fresh air and beautiful scenery and lots of wildlife which has just been tremendous and the shells and the things that you can find along the beach that you wouldn't think you could find that come from thousands and thousands of miles away that you wouldn't think would make it this far that have traveled that far. Well you got a, yeah. you got a, um, a conch, a fighting conch. conch. Fighting conch. Yeah. This is, an, this is a keeper for you. Keep that one because Strombus is more southern, they're more tropical, and they're just not at all common on our beach up here. You've got a near perfect customer. And they're well, almost in danger, isn't that right? When you first come into the cave, it's a lot of rubble and debris, and you're pretty close to the ceiling of the cave. But as you come out into this area, it's just all of a sudden wide open, uh, enormous, awesome size. The whole room is just surrounded by cave columns and stalactites, stalagmites all over the place. It's taking a lot of responsibility to step into such a um, area that has been off limits to so many over time. There's one right here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's two or three. Most of the caves in Texas are very small caves, and Kickapoo is quite large, and uh, the feeling of space is pretty amazing. Of the wall, a whole bunch of people from Brackettville. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, Brackettville's real close by, of course. I don't personally like to see graffiti in a cave because it reminds me of man's presence, and man is just all too present in so much of so many places that were once wild. Access to Kickapoo Caverns is now limited to passport holders through guided tours, protecting the cave from further graffiti and vandalism. 1889, 1887. I think I saw an 1881. Well, some of the names and dates are very interesting in that they're maybe 100 years old, and they, they, they give us that sense of history. It almost seems out of place to me in something that is literally eons old.
Visiting any of the state parks or similar places uh, puts me in touch with nature, which is important to me. I mean, see new sights and birds and flowers and rock formations and things that I might not see otherwise. Uh, we're looking at a woolly mullein plant. Mullein is M-U-L-L-E-I-N. It's one of the most ancient, a lot of medicinal purposes. Sometimes they would dry the leaves and smoke them uh, and use them for coughs or bronchitis. Um, you'll see a dried stalk right there. When it blossoms, it's yellow blossoms all up and down that stalk. Uh, those, they would remove the blossoms, soak them in an olive oil, um, and use it to cure bronchitis or uh, any kind of the common colds. The leaf is very thick and very soft with all the, the woolly hairs on it. And I've also read that early settlers would take those and put them in their shoes during the wintertime to help provide some cushioning and some heat. There's a dozen native species of fish here, including the Guadalupe bass, which is the state fish. Now you notice the water is, has a real nice coloring to it. It's kind of a blue-green color. That's uh, caused by algae and plankton in the water. And this is very beneficial because to the fish, it's a food, food source. They eat this. It grows. Hill Tunnel Wildlife Management Area was once a tunnel for the uh, Fredericksburg Northern Rail Line. After the line was discontinued, the bats moved into the tunnel, and we currently know that they've been there at least since 1942 to the present. I guess most people actually think of bats being silent creatures of the night, and, and they are pretty much silent, except when you get a million of them in one place, and they all come out uh, you know, in, a, in a streamer into a column. The Texas Conservation Passport I feel is a good mechanism to allow non-traditional users to come onto the WMAs, the wildlife management areas, and enjoy some of the resources that up until this point, uh, typically if you did not hunt or fish, uh, you weren't aware that they even existed. I think that the conservation passport is a uh, great idea by the Parks and Wildlife people uh, to allow a, a select group of people who uh, are willing to spend a little money, buy the passport, help contribute to the upkeep of these parks. And you get terrific rates for a fun day away from the hustle and bustle of the everyday life. It was a wonderful investment. I would recommend it to anybody. Next on Experience Texas, will visit Hill Country State Natural Area. Located just outside the town of Bandera, the park has adapted well to being so near to the self-proclaimed cowboy capital of the world. Winding throughout the natural area's 5,000 acres are over 30 miles of trails. These trails take the visitor through a variety of landscapes, steep escarpments, rolling grasslands, and cool streams. Isn't that pretty? One activity that attracts yeah, park goers is identifying the wide range of plants found in the area. But it's also used like for bedding, probably by the Native Americans, and even some animals. I know like on the coast, the, um, Alligators actually use the Spanish moss. They kind of make their nest with it. The majority of our, our visitors are equestrians. They come from all over the state, uh, Louisiana, Oklahoma. The vistas and the scenery and um, uh, just the, the freedom, the feeling of freedom that they get. A lot of folks, they've, ne they've never ridden in an area like this unrestricted. Although they are required to stay on the trails, I guess by unrestricted, I mean the whole, the openness of the whole area. Hill Country State Natural Area is one of the few state parks where horseback riding is allowed on the trails. This is a unique recreational opportunity, and special consideration is given to the needs of the cowboy camper. For example, there's mini corrals in the main camping area. Bicycles are also allowed on certain trails, but horses are by far the more popular. 
to get out here and hear the birds sing, not hear no horns, no noise, just ride and hear the rocks under the horse's feet. For those who don't own horses or just want to visit for a day, there are a number of nearby commercial ranches providing horses and guides on an hourly and daily basis. This park out here is, is very unique to me. Of course, I've been around here for 33 years. I knew the place before it was ever a park. But some of the most beautiful scenery to me in the state of Texas is right here in this natural area. Hill Country State Natural Area is located on FM Road 1077, just 10 miles southwest of Bandera and 45 miles west of San Antonio. The appeal of this natural area lies in its simplicity. The wide vistas and rocky trails will continue to draw the naturalist, the equestrian, and the hiker. There is a feeling of solitude among these hills where the visitor can experience the unspoiled beauty of the Texas Hill Country. <laughs>